Throughout the galaxy, mankind clings to survival, despite being forced to endure an unrelenting onslaught at the hands of the alien, the mutant, and the heretic. Our noble forces are well acquainted with the myriad of enemies who seek our downfall, and the erudite strategists of the Imperial military have constructed incredibly comprehensive battle plans for combating specific enemy tactics. With that being said, however, only in the current millennia have we encountered a new threat, which chooses to fight in a most unconventional way. We are to delve into the story of the foul and malign gene stealer cults. These abhorrent cultists comprise of Imperial citizens who have fallen to the worship of the Tyranid gene stealers and who have dedicated the rest of their treacherous lives towards the reverence of a mysterious alien god. Now the extent to which the cultists are willingly following the gene stealers, as opposed to being ensnared by their psychic tendrils of dominance, is somewhat debated, but we shall soon discover the true nature to their worship. The incredibly secretive cults thrive within the dark corners of the Imperium, where the neglected and forsaken citizens of an oppressed hive world may hear the sordid whispers of a better life, achieved through Xenos worship. Once rooted, a cult will be incredibly difficult to dislodge, and they will persist as a malignant cancer within the slums and workplaces of a world. Their ultimate goal would be to wrangle control of their planet from the ignorant and aged leadership, at which point they will bring about their day of salvation, whereby they will telepathically summon their Xenos god to join them upon their world. It should go without saying, but their god will not actually join them in the fashion which they imagined, but I shall soon elucidate as to the events which will transpire for a cult which achieves its wretched goals. Today I shall attempt to illuminate the darkness of the cults to you. I shall cover the inception of a gene-stealer cult, ranging from a single creature descending upon a world through to the development of several generations of hybrids. And then I shall finally reveal to you the true nefarious nature of their god. Before we begin, I shall pose a question to you. Would you sooner face off against a brutal beast which would roar a challenge of combat before charging directly towards you? Or would you rather be opposed to something which lurks in the dark and stalks you for months until you finally let your guard down and it strikes when you were least prepared? The reason I ask this is because for the gene stealer cults, they most certainly fall into the second category of this question. They exist only in the dark, shadowy recesses of society, being completely hidden from the watchful and scrutinous eyes of a world's defensive forces. The cultists understand that they are disgusting rejects, but only because the rest of humanity has not yet accepted their gift. Because of this, they will shroud themselves in secrecy, where they will plot and formulate their strategies until an opportune moment arises where they will emerge and strike from the terrifying darkness. The Imperium is ever vigilant against the insidious forces of chaos, which oftentimes will manifest itself in small communities before spreading out to claim an entire planet. Because of this, the agents of the Inquisition and the Ordo Hereticus exist, and they will scour an entire city to excise the threat of one tainted, corrupted individual. The same countermeasures do not exist to counter the emergence of a gene-stealer cult, however. The Ordo Xenos have only recently discovered the existence of the cultists, and they do not have the capabilities for traversing the galaxy in the same way as the Inquisition. So it is much harder for them to investigate rumors of a cult appearing. Because of this, the infectious tendrils of the cultists have been allowed to spread far and wide.
and they seem to have infiltrated every crevice and corner of the Imperium, with vile rumors suggesting that there exists a cult upon Holy Terror itself. The humans who have succumbed to the sway of a cult will be united in their sole purpose of bringing about the downfall of their world, all to please their foul alien deity. Their strategy is defined by patience and will strongly rely upon clandestine acts of sabotage against military targets, as well as through the use of disseminating insidious propaganda, all to draw more unsuspecting souls to join in their dark cause. It is only when the planet stands unprepared that they will unleash the true scale of their malevolent plans Thousands upon thousands of mutated cultists will surge forth from every forgotten shadow, bringing with them a trove of stolen weaponry and ramshackle industrial equipment, which they will use to conquer their former home, all as an act of reverence to their god. The stalwart members of the Ordo Xenos and the tacticians of the Death Watch have gained a truly impressive understanding towards the nature of a gene-stealer. They were first encountered upon the moons of Imgal during the 41st millennium, and after centuries of study, we can safely say that they exist as the first of the vanguard forces for the ever-devouring Tyranids. Gene-stealers will be deployed to a planet long before a hive fleet begins its invasion and they are introduced solely to spread fear and disunity upon the world in order to weaken their prey, leaving them as ripe targets for the impending onslaught of the hive. Whilst the gene stealers may be incredibly vicious creatures themselves who can easily rip through even Astarte's Terminator armor, it is their mastery of stealth and supernatural cunning which sets them apart as truly vile foes. The foul aliens will infiltrate an Imperial ship before entering into a state of hibernation, where they will patiently wait until the craft descends to make planet fall. Upon arrival, they will then slink out and delve into the shadows, seeking out the dark forgotten recesses in which to call a home. It will only take one gene stealer to begin the process of bringing about the downfall of a planet which makes the concept of an infested space hulk containing untold thousands of gene stealers ever more horrific. Now, once a gene stealer has scurried its way into the darkness of an imperial world, it will rapidly begin to enact its terrible methods of subterfuge. The Xenos will first locate small dens for itself to lurk and recuperate in. It is here that the beast will feast upon the brains of any hapless victims who were unfortunate enough to be lured and entrapped within its burrow. It is essential to remember that for the gene stealers, they can obtain the memories and knowledge of whatever creature they consume. So it is from these first victims that the gene stealer will learn of the most obvious vulnerabilities of a world. Now this is all well and good, but a single gene stealer will require far more support to truly bring a planet to its knees, so at this stage it will begin to form the cult. Hundreds of humans will be abducted from their homes, their places of work, or even just from walking through an isolated alleyway, and the gene stealer will then initiate its genetic plan. The pure strain gene stealer can implant a victim with its own genetic material, which will infest and intertwine itself within the genome of the host. This first infection will not cause any significant changes to the human, as the mutations all lie in a dormant state. However, the individual will still have become ensnared by the hypnotic psychic spell of the gene stealer marking them as the first true members of the burgeoning cult. At this stage, the insidious tendrils of the Gene Stealer will have taken root, and a terrible series of events will have begun, all to bring about 
the damnation of this world. It is only when these humans give birth that the first signs of mutation appear. The progeny of these humans will be born as clear genetic freaks, known as Malignasi, and they will appear as a grotesque amalgamation of both a human and of a gene stealer. Their heads are notably larger than a regular human, with a small crest jutting from their domed crown, whilst their hands will terminate with long, razor-sharp talons and claws. These afflicted horrors will even be endowed with several additional limbs, jutting out from their bulky, hunched frames. In addition, their skin will closely mirror that of a gene stealer, being tinged with a faint purple hue. As these hybrids mature, they will more closely resemble a gene stealer compared to a human, and it would be completely impossible for these individuals to blend into society. Because of this, they will remain within the shadows, enacting the will of the gene stealer by abducting new unfortunate humans to be infected and indoctrinated by the cult. I should note here that the first gene stealer who infects a human will also undergo a rather stark physiological change. Each individual who it infects and each of their offspring will form a psychic link to this creature, producing what is referred to as the brood mind. And from this, the alien will rapidly swell with power. As the cult grows, the gene stealer will soon be referred to as the Patriarch, and it will be able to commune with each cult member to drive them forward in completing their foul goals. In addition, the Patriarch will grow to be an incredibly physically imposing creature, oftentimes standing at twice the height of an Astartes, whilst wielding colossal claws which can tear through even the armor of a battle tank. But despite this, the true menace of a patriarch lies in its mental prowess. It will orchestrate every action of the new formed cult, serving as a malevolent puppet master who will pull the strings of each devoted follower. Each directive and every order will be formulated by this creature purely in order to nurture the growth of their cult and to further propagate its dark influences. Returning to the hybrids, as the first generation infects more humans upon a world, their progeny will be born with fewer traits of the gene stealer. With that being said, the second generation will still appear as unmistakably alien in their appearance. They will adopt a rather hunched frame, seeming as a perpetually coiled spring, akin to a predator who is ready to pounce upon their unsuspecting prey. Many of these hybrids will still display additional limbs as a hallmark of their tainted lineage. However, their facial features will more strongly resemble that of a baseline human. The sharp alien features of a gene stealer's face will recede, being replaced by a softer, more human visage which more closely resembles that of an unsettlingly harrowed sapien. However, despite this appearance of humanity, their minds remain far too unstable for them to begin with full infiltration missions. Though they may understand the intricacies of human society, their thoughts and impulses remain as markedly primal and alien. Consequently, their role within the cult is confined to industrial operations, which allows them to contribute to the completion of their sinister goals through a more brutish method. The captives who are infected by these individuals will give birth to the third generation, and these may be known as true hybrids. For the offspring are seen less as genetic amalgamations and more as creatures who display the best features of both species. They stand just as a conventional human would and they overtly display far fewer traits of the gene stealer DNA, allowing them to better infiltrate the larger human society. With that being said, if one was to take a closer look to a true hybrid, then they would quickly notice several abnormalities. This generation is still tinted by the slight lilac hue of their patriarch, 
and their crown is still crested by a small alien ridge. But if the hybrid is careful, then he can hide these features with a hood and drift through society just as normal. The previous generations of hybrid are primarily focused towards spreading the cult by abducting and infecting new members. However, by the third generation, the cultists begin to take on more advanced roles to best bring about their goal. For example, oftentimes a figure known as a Kelomorph will appear within a cult. This is a revolutionary fighter who has become somewhat of a legend within the folklore of the cultists, resulting in them having idealized the figure into becoming a near mythic hero the Kelomorph will don themselves in a hooded cloak before venturing through the busiest and most dangerous regions of a planet, utilizing the myriad of pistols and blades at their disposal to bring ruin to the enemies of the cult before vanishing back into the shadows. They will have successfully sowed the fertile seeds of a coming revolution by battling against all forms of tyranny and authoritative cruelty. Now this all sounds well and good and perhaps quite impressive or inspiring even, for who amongst us cannot appreciate the tale of a masked gunslinger wrangling freedom for the common folk from the oppressive grip of their hateful rulers? In reality, though, this story has been carefully formed and meticulously crafted by the Patriarch for a specific purpose. The Kelomorph has been formed as a unique bioform, which expresses the traits and features necessary for such missions. However, this was only done to exploit the moral psychology of the human cult members. The cultists will hear the tales of the Kelomorph and will be inspired by such a heroic figure that they will work with an increased sense of purpose and fervor towards achieving their final goals. Before we move on to the fourth generation, I shall briefly speak of some of the genetic failures of this hybridization process. At any stage of this process, a newborn member from any generation can emerge as what is known as an aberrant. These are utterly misshaped, broken individuals who oftentimes do not survive their own birth. However, for the hardiest of them who endure their own pained existence, they still serve a purpose within the cult. Their lumpen heads contain a malformed, barely functional brain, which only provides the aberrant with an innate sense of survival and an urge to defend their broodkin. They are rather useful, however, since any surviving aberrants are incomprehensibly strong when compared to their more stable hybrid counterparts. They wield gigantic industrial tools or simple hunks of rock which they use to pummel and devastate whatever they encounter. Even though these creatures appear to be clear abominations, the Patriarch will send out a soothing psychic signal to every member of the cult, making them strangely protective of their malformed cousin. Because of this, the aberrants will be carefully nurtured and tended to by all, and the cultists will always attempt to include them within their plans if some semblance of brute force is required. This now brings us to the fourth generation, the Primasi. These are the perfected and penultimate genetic hybrid of human and gene-stealer DNA, whereby they can fully blend in with the human population while still retaining some benefits of their alien mutations. Thanks to their genetic gifts, as well as the psychic signals from the Patriarch, they are far sharper and have far better reaction speeds when compared to a baseline human, allowing them to be incredibly effective operatives who will enact the plans and projects of the cult. Most of the hybrids who persist within the larger human society will actually end up being commended by their superiors, who simply see them as hardworking and attentive citizens. But these overseers are sorely mistaken. All work carried out by the fourth generation will be done to further spread the influence of the cult. 
they may be deployed to steal vital military documents to locate vulnerable industrial areas which can be easily sabotaged or to simply draw more weak-willed members to their cause. Similar to the previous generation, some of the hybrids will have been bred to express specific traits in order to fulfill specialized roles within the cult. For example, perhaps the most influential and prominent member of the cult would be the Magus. This is an incredibly psychically potent individual who acts as something of a spiritual enforcer towards the members of the cult and as a persuasive diplomat for those who have not yet fallen to the sway of the gene stealer. Most members of a cult will have never directly seen the presiding patriarch, and some may consider him as but a mythical entity, but with the appearance of the Magus, none can doubt his existence. This is because the Magus stands as something of a prophet to the Patriarch in that she will relay his will and his directives to the cult in a more direct way as opposed to the conventional psychic messaging. The entire cult must hear the Magus's word as unquestionable law, but thanks to the Prophet's potent psychic abilities, if any were to doubt the teachings of the cult, then they would quickly be identified and rooted out. Despite these psychic powers and influential role within the cult, we must remember that all of this has been deployed as a part of the Patriarch's plan. The Magus simply serves as a physical manifestation of the Gene Stealer's will, and in some ways, their presence is simply to inspire some semblance of devotion, much in the same way as the previously described Kelomorphs. Nevertheless, a Magus still has an important role to play in the final days of the cult's existence. A prized goal for the cultists would be to overthrow and supplant a planet's governor with one of their own. And it is here that the Magus comes into play. They often already exist within the Imperial aristocracy, and so it is rather easy for them to gain an audience with the ruling governor. At this point, they will either attempt to psychically sway them to the cause of the gene stealer, or they will simply kill them, only to replace the ignorant ruler with one of their own hybrids, utterly solidifying the control of the planet to that of the cult. At this point, the cult will have spread to every corner of the planet, and oftentimes the cultists will outnumber the ignorant and loyal members of society but it is here that the cult prepares for war. At this point, the Patriarch has swelled with power to the point where he has psychic control over the majority of the citizens upon a world, and it is from this that he can emit an immense signal to the hive mind, signaling the fleet that the planet is ripe for conquest. With the Patriarch now standing as a psychic beacon to the hive mind, Many more changes will occur within the cult. Some of the hybrid offspring will be born as metamorphs, which possess strange mutated limbs, which are reminiscent of the weaponized organs of the primary Tyranid hive fleet. This can manifest as gigantic crushing claws, scything talons, or lash whips, and these mutations are coupled with the individual's frame being ever more hunched similar to that of a pure strain gene stealer. This paints a rather stark image of these creatures having been built for war. The psychic signals from the Patriarch have initiated an irreversible switch within the cultists' genomes, and at this point they are mutating into bioforms who exist only to kill. This brings us to the final generation of hybrids, known as the Puri. The fifth generation is rather paradoxical in that its offspring will no longer be born for infiltrative roles, so they will not appear similar to the host species at all, and instead they will be born as pure strain gene stealers. 
These are almost entirely indistinguishable from the original gene stealer who descended upon the planet. However, they may display some primitive and subtle traits of the host species, such as by showing slightly rounded teeth or by expressing some colored patterns upon their carapace. With that being said, these traits slowly recede and will eventually disappear completely until the gene stealer retains only their own tyranid DNA. With this generation, the remaining days for the planet will be numbered. The psychic signal from the Patriarch will initiate a full-scale revolution upon the planet, where the cult members will emerge from hiding to overthrow whatever organizations remained loyal to the Imperium and to finally take control of the entire world. With the utter chaos and disarray caused by this conflict, the planet's defenders will likely not have time to appropriately prepare for the encroaching Hive Fleet, which has been rapidly advancing through space to meet the screeching signal of the Patriarch. The cult members who exist upon the world will likely see the Hive Fleet as being a manifestation of their mysterious alien god. And in some ways they are correct, but it is at this point that they will realize the folly of their ways. The Tyranids who descend have done so for only one reason, and it is to feed and consume all they encounter. They care not for the fact that the citizens may worship and revere them as gods, for at the end of the day, they are still a source of biomass to be devoured for the betterment of the hive. At this point, the fabled Holy Day of Salvation will have finally been reached. The Patriarch will emerge from his dark lair, finally making his presence known to the members of the cult who will be spurred into a state of religious frenzy at seeing their spiritual leader. The cult will temporarily be protected by the ravenous hive fleet, as the hive mind will acknowledge the cult as being beneficial during this stage of the invasion. As the cultists enter into battle, they will chant songs of praise towards the writhing tyranid swarm, and they will dutifully follow their patriarch as he rips his way through the foul unbelievers. However, the cult was never intended to endure this invasion. As the battle fades into victory, and as the defenders are rooted, the hive mind will signal to the patriarch that he has fulfilled his purpose, and that he is no longer required upon the field. The grossly powerful gene stealer will quickly descend into a feeding pool to be subsumed by the hive, and as his powerful, potent brain is dissolved by the boiling acids, his connection to the cult will finally be severed. In a horrifying instant, the entire cult will realize the terrible truth of their actions. They no longer feel a link to one another, and they will truly see the sheer level of death and destruction which they have brought to the planet. In their final moments, the creatures who they worshipped as prophesied gods will fall upon them with ravenous intent, ripping them limb from limb, caring not for their feeble cries of desperation. With the cult's destruction, the pure strain gene stealers will attempt to flee the planet aboard escaping Imperial craft, where they will return to dormancy before the ship lands on another distant world and the cycle of death will begin again.